morning, friends, brothers and sisters. With you again. On my schedule uh, was to give a fifth sermon in our series on the sacraments, uh, during which we have talked for um, an extended period of time about what sacraments are and how they operate, what their significance is, what their power and efficacy is, and also uh, whom they are intended for. Who's supposed to take them and how are they supposed to take them and how the taking of the sacraments defines the covenant community and the body of Christ and nourishes it uh, in its life in the world. And, and today I was going to um, kind of put a bow on that uh, because I'm going to be gone next week out of town at a wedding and then the week after that is our is the day of our baptism service when we're going to welcome some new people into the family of God. Um, am I right? Am I wrong? Oh, there's one more, one more after that. Okay, very good, very good. Oh, good. Well, maybe I'll get to wrap it up later because the gist of what I have to say is I'm not going to preach about that today. Um, I got to church this morning as uh, empty as a pocket. And um, as Missy mentioned, we've been going through a few things recently in our business, which since it's a family business, is also in our marriage and in our uh, most intimate relationships and um, have been dealing with that and it's been very good uh, in some ways that aren't necessary to share but it's been very real and very good and I'm exhausted and Missy's exhausted too in a good way but in the way that you get when you've been dealing with the Lord and um, uh, have not prepared anything like a sermon for the good of the faithful and the thing about that is really interesting is that it would be a lie for me to say that I had. And I'm the kind of guy that would tell that lie and have told that lie. So by way of a confession, I am that. Oh, my name is Adam. <laughs> and I am that kind of liar. And by the grace of God, I will not lie to you today. I don't have anything prepared to say. However, as David just reminded us, <laughs> um, it reminded me through a little wordless comment, well, I guess we had church already. We can go home now because the saints of God have gathered together as his body, every joint supplying, and have done his true work, lifted up his name in praise. We have said of ourselves, vicariously if not for ourselves behold I am a sinner standing in need of prayer and of the mercies of God and the benefits of his covenant and we've lifted each other up in prayer we've walked in the light with one another what more could you possibly want what more could you possibly want so what I want to do today is save the time that we have come to spend for fellowship and for continued prayer and for the taking of the sacraments and do nothing more than read something that I read during uh, the time when we were praying for Dwayne and have you roll this around on your spiritual tongues. It's James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Here's a great description of the body of Christ in action. One of the reasons that I want to be hard-pressed ever to go somewhere else. The body of Christ in this little corner of the world Prays for itself. 
and taps into the effectual power as it is working. I'm so thankful to be in a community where we have at least are in the process of offloading the veil of pretense and the veneer of togetherness that the church so often struggles with. So grateful to be in a place where the guy who's in charge of the worship service says, does anybody need prayer for sin today? And then before he can, words can get out of his mouth, he says, I do. And we gather around and pray for him. And we don't pray for him, it seems like. And maybe I'm giving us too much credit, but I don't really think so. We don't pray for him as a sorry sucker who <laughs> needs to be brought back up to the line and then reach down from the solid ground of obedience and rightness and justice and pull, offer to pull him up to where we are. We know each other and ourselves too well for that. We jump down in the trench, mud with him, and say, God have mercy. And pray for ourselves, as Kathy suggested just a minute ago, every bit as much as we pray for him in that moment. Man, that is the gospel at work. I'm so grateful for the reminder that I have of that today. Because um, I don't have anything to give but that today. But a, um, a falling down into the trench next to my people and begging for the mercy of God. So, I'm a little choked up about it because it's very real, but not in the least discouraged. Not in the least discouraged. It turns out that the promise in that passage is the promise to all who pray. The promise to all who live the life that prayer symbolizes and signifies. You know what that life is, don't you? It's the life of the empty hand. It's the life of the needy sufferer. It's the life of the one who says, as we have been saying together for months now, Oh God, save me, I'm dead. The promise to the one who prays, who lives that life, is that he will be healed. That the Lord will raise him up. And I, in my capacity as preacher, will say nothing more than this today. You will be healed. We will be healed. The Lord will raise us up love the way David put it. Here's evidence for you. Here's evidence for you that he has not forgotten us. Here's evidence that he's always at work, that his plan has an end, and that end is restoration and fulfillment and reconciliation and health and all things new and all things under one head, even Christ. And do you know the evidence that David, I'll put words in his mouth for a second, he can correct me later. Do you know the evidence he was pointing to that was so encouraging? It was the sight of sin that Dwayne was standing in. Oh no, he said, I just realized I'm a sinner in this way. I didn't know it before, I didn't grasp it before, it hadn't landed in my heart. And David saw that and said, aha, we are not alone. We are not alone. Because the one who has a plan to restore and heal all of us is at work every day in a strange way in a strange way bringing us to the end of ourselves bringing us to the spot where the only thing we can see is what screw ups we are and dragging us into his fellowship so that the other screw ups in the group can say hello Dwayne and jump down in the trench with him and pray thank God that he has made us a people of prayer. I'm so grateful for that today. And I rejoice, though with tears, in the great privilege that I have of being empty-handed today, completely pocket empty, with no recourse but to pray for healing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let us um, take the Lord's Supper together.